All right, so today we're going to talk about doctrine. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the core um, beliefs within Islam, um, some of which we've talked about already, some of which are new. Um, so Islam is, of course, a monotheism. There is a strong belief in one God. Uh, and Prothero calls it a strict or a hard monotheism as opposed to the soft monotheism of Christianity. Um, and that's because there is a lot of emphasis on the oneness of God, the unity of God, um, that God has no equals, God has no partners. Um, so God is just one. So it's a, a strict monotheism. Um, and the Arabic word that, that kind of represents this unity or oneness of God is Tawhid, T-A-W-H-I-D. Um, and uh, the, the second term that I have here is shirk. Um, and shirk is basically, you could say, sort of the, the most serious offense or the most, uh, the, the most serious sin uh, in Islam, which is to raise anything else to the level of God or to give God partners. Um, so this, this could refer to lots of different things, um, but it kind of connects back to that quote that we started with, um, that in Islam there's no God but God. So only God is God, nothing else in the world is God. Um, so it could refer to polytheism, um, because remember Islam started uh, in uh, Arabian tribal culture, where there were a lot of polytheistic tribes, tr polytheistic tribal religions. So in one sense, it's a teaching or a warning against polytheism. Um, in another sense, it's uh, a warning against treating anything else in your life as God. Um, that basically, if you, you know, if you believe in God, if you want to follow God, um, then God should be the center of your life. Um, you know, thinking about God, praying to God, making decisions based on God and, and what God wants of you. Um, but it's very possible that something else can become the center of your life. Um, and if that has happened, then you've made that your God. Um, so if, you know, success is something that you think about all the time, and all of your decisions are sort of based around, you know, what will make me successful, then success is your God, right? Success is the center of your life. Um, so you don't want to worship other gods, uh, but you also don't want to, um, you don't want to raise anything else in your life to the level of God, right? You've given God like a rival um, for, uh, for your heart and, and your, your center of your life. Um, it could also uh, be referring to people mistakenly thinking that things are God that are not God. Um, so there are uh, verses in the Quran that talk about, um, you know, God not having an equal or a partner or a son, um, that God doesn't have, you know, isn't, doesn't have a biological son, um, doesn't have relatives. So it's also a warning uh, against making the mistake that Christianity made, according to Islam, which is mistaking the prophet of God, Jesus, um, or Isa, as we talked about, um, mistaking the prophet of God for God himself. Um, so, so all of these would, uh, would be considered shirk or could be considered shirk. Um, so the, the emphasis in Islam is on the oneness of God and the transcendence of God, uh, that God is wholly other. Um, God is beyond this world, beyond our understanding. Um, so we shouldn't worship things in this world as if they're God, because only God is God. Um, related to this uh, is the notion of the people of the book. Um, and in Arabic, it's al al-kitab, which just means the people of the book. Um, the Quran frequently talks about the people of the book, uh, and the people of the book refers to Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Um, all three of those religious communities are part of the people of the book, um, because remember, Islam sees itself as the continuation and the completion of the religious story that starts with Judaism, runs through Christianity, and is completed in Islam. Um, so all three of those communities received a book, right? The Jews received the Torah, the Christians uh, received the New Testament, and the Muslims received the Quran. So in one sense, all three of those religious communities and all three of those texts are equal, right? They're, they're a family of religions. They're closely related to each other. Um, and as you can see from what we've talked about so far, 
there's a lot of similarity, there's a lot of overlap between these three religious traditions. Um, and Muslims view the Torah and the New Testament as sacred scripture um, because they are texts written about true prophets of God. Right? Adam is a prophet, Abraham is a prophet, Isaac is a prophet, um, uh, Aaron is a prophet, Moses is a prophet, Noah is a prophet, Jesus is a prophet. Um, so all of the, both of these texts, the Torah and the New Testament, um, they are sacred because they are about um, people who receive messages from God and, and taught those messages to their communities. So there's a lot of verses in the Quran that really sort of celebrate and focus on the oneness um, of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. They all worship the same God, right? They're all part of the same religious family. Um, so in one sense, they, they are all equal and they're closely related to each other. But of course, in another sense, um, Muslims don't read the Torah or the New Testament, they read the Quran, um, because the Quran is the complete and perfect revelation of God, according to Muslims, um, and the stories within it, some of the stories, correct mistakes that got into the Torah and the New Testament, um, because those texts, the Torah and the New Testament, um, because they took so long to be written down, um, and they were passed down for such a long period of time, um, just being written by hand. Um, Muslims believe that errors, human errors, got into those texts. So the versions of the stories in the Torah and the New Testament um, are not 100% accurate. So whenever there's a different version of the story in the Quran, um, Muslims view the Quranic version as the correct version. So that's why there, there in one sense is this, this sense of sort of family resemblance um, and close connection between the three uh, religious traditions, but there's of course also a, a preference for one's own sacred text, that the Quran is the, the most accurate and, and the perfect revelation. Um, but the people of the book are mentioned many, many times in the Quran, um, especially in the sense that uh, Muslims need to respect and honor the rest of the people of the book because of the similarities in their traditions. Um, so then uh, the next item that I have here is the Quran, which we've already started talking about. Um, the Quran is the sacred text of Islam, and there's a picture of it behind me here. Um, the word Quran in Arabic just means recitation. Um, so the Quran, the content of the Quran, are all of the revelations or recitations that Muhammad received, right? So for 22, the last 22 years of Muhammad's life, he received these revelations from God. He would speak those revelations to the community. He would recite those revelations to the community. Um, and the community collected them and wrote them down in the Quran. Um, so it's important to know that the Quran is not a book about Muhammad. Um, Muhammad really isn't in the Quran that much. Um, Jesus is in the Quran a lot more than Muhammad is. Um, Muhammad is just seen as the vessel through which the Quran was revealed. Um, so, so the content of it uh, is just those, those 22 years of revelations. Um, but it's, uh, it's ordered in an interesting way. So the Quran um, the Quran is divided up into 114 sections, which are called surahs, S-U-R-A-S. Um, so 114 surahs. Um, and they're not, um, the order of them is not chronological. So it's not like the Quran starts, you know, with like the first revelation that Muhammad received and then goes through the rest of his life. Um, it's actually ordered in terms of length. So it starts with the longest surahs and then goes to the shortest surahs in the back. Um, so it's ordered it in a way uh, that that might be um, um, that might be un unexpected. Um, but it has to do with one of the main purposes of the Quran, which is to be recited. Um, the Quran is not a text that's meant to just be read. Right? Otherwise, it would be the readings or something like that. But no, the Quran are the recitations. Um, so it's important to know that the Quran is written in poetry. It's not written in prose. Um, it's written in Arabic poetry, and it's meant to be recited. It's meant to be heard. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about this already. Um, and in the, the link that I posted uh, on Canvas that has several YouTube videos, um, the first one is a Quranic recitation, so you can hear what the Quran sounds like. 
Um, it's not just the content of the Quran that is sacred to Muslims. It's also the sound of the Quran. Um, that the Quran is supposed to be the most beautiful piece of poetry ever written in Arabic. Um, and that's very important for Muslims because it's seen as proof of its divinity. Um, that it's so beautiful that no human being could have written it. Um, so it's important to know that that's, uh, that's a very important aspect of the Quran. It's, it's really not meant to just be read silently. Um, you can do that, of course. You can read the Quran, but it's not written like a narrative. It's not written like a continuous story. Um, as I mentioned, it's divided up into these surahs. The surahs are divided by length. So it's, it sort of shows you that it's, it's set up for being recited. Um, so that you know how long um, you're going to be reciting for. So you can, it's divided up like that. Um, and the, the individual surahs, they're not just like on one topic. It's not like each surah um, or each revelation just is sort of continuous about one topic. Um, it can talk about many, many different topics in one surah. So it kind of jumps around. Um, so it's really, again, not meant to just like be, you know, you sit down and read the Quran. Um, you are supposed to recite the poetry of the Quran. Um, and then the next thing I have here is that the Quran for Muslims is, of course, the word of God. And this is a common phrase for a lot of different religious communities in, in terms of their sacred text. Um, this is also what Christians call the Bible. Christians say that the Bible is the word of God. Um, but it's important to know that when Christians call the Bible the Word of God and when Muslims call the Quran the Word of God, they don't mean the same thing. Um, that, that, that phrase or that title has a different implication for both of those communities. For Christians, the Bible is the Word of God in the sense that the Bible was written by several human authors over, um, you know, over hundreds of years. Uh, but as those human authors were writing the texts of the Quran, or sorry, the texts of the Bible, um, they were guided by the Spirit of God. So God was sort of guiding that process uh, and making sure that they wrote the correct information and that all of that information was canonized in the Bible. Um, but it was done through the, you know, the ideas and words of human beings. When a Muslim says that the Quran is the word of God, they mean something very different. Um, they mean that actually every single word in the Quran is the word that God spoke. Um, so Muslims believe that God spoke to the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel spoke those words to Muhammad. Muhammad then spoke those words to the community. The community collected those words, either through memorization or writing them down, and then those words were compiled into the Quran. So that means that every single word in the Quran comes directly from the mouth of God, uh, and they believe that there were no errors in that line of transmission, right? From God to the Quran, everything was, was perfectly kept, no mistakes got into that line of transmission. Um, so it is literally the word of God for Muslims. Um, and that's why it's important that the Quran is only the Quran in Arabic. God chose to give his revelations in the Arabic language, and that's important for Muslims. Um, so you have to read the Quran in Arabic. You can, of course, buy the Quran and read the Quran in any language that you like, right? In our world's wisdom text, we're reading passages from the Quran in English. Um, but if you ever like buy an, an English version of the Quran or a Spanish version of the Quran, uh, you'll notice that either on the cover or the title page, it'll say like the uh, translation of the Quran or a translation of the recitations. Um, so it's very clear the understanding in the community is that the Quran in translation is not the Quran. The Quran is only the Quran if you're actually reading it in Arabic um, because God chose those specific words so you can only really understand what God is saying if you read it in its original language um, because as any bilingual person will tell you, you can never perfectly translate um, from one language to another. There are always going to be sort of cultural and linguistic differences um, in that translation. Um, so. The, the idea is that you can read the Quran in translation, 
to start getting a, you know, a, a good idea of what God says, but you can't have a full understanding of it until you actually read it in Arabic. Um, and that's something that most Muslims in the world have to learn how to do. Um, only about 15% of Muslims worldwide actually are native Arabic speakers. Um, so for the vast majority of Muslims, they have to learn Arabic in order to read their sacred text. Um, so mosques usually also have Arabic school or an Arabic class um, so that children can start learning how to read and, and recite Arabic uh, from a young age um, so that they can learn to read their sacred text in its original language. Um, and actually also interesting to note, even, even those people who do speak Arabic, if Arabic is their native language, um, the Arabic of the Quran is so different that even they have to learn how to read the Quran. Um, because languages change and develop over time. Um, and the Quran is written in 7th century Arabic. Um, and it's, it's poetry. It's a very sophisticated form uh, of the written Arabic language. Um, and so the, the Arabic spoken language has developed for 1400 years. Um, so even people who speak Arabic today have to study to learn how to understand um, the, the Quranic Arabic. It's, it's sort of its own um, its own type of language. Um, it, it would be similar, you know, or it is similar to um, those of us who are native English speakers. We can't just go and easily read Shakespeare. Um, it's a very high style of the language from hundreds of years ago. Um, so we have to really study and pay attention and focus uh, to be able to understand Shakespeare. It doesn't just come easily or naturally to us. Um, so those are, um, those are some basic information, or that's some basic information about the Quran. Um, and also, because it's the literal word of God, it's important to know how special the Quran is to Muslims. Um, and the Prothero text uh, talks about this um, in terms of what's a good comparison to the role the Quran plays in Islam. Um, so Prothero talks about a scholar of religion named Wilfred Contwell Smith, um, who's a very, very well-known uh, author in the field of religious studies. Um, and he makes the point that Westerners, um, especially people who have some knowledge of Christianity, tend to make a comparison when they learn about Islam. Um, they tend to see, you know, that, oh yeah, Islam also has an important figure, Muhammad. Um, and it also has an important sacred text, the Quran. Um, so Westerners, or those coming from the Christian perspective, tend to compare Jesus and Muhammad, and then the Bible and the Quran, um, because those are kind of two obvious comparisons. Um, but Professor Smith says that's, that's not really the right comparison, um, because Jesus and Muhammad play very different roles in the tradition, and so do the Bible and the Quran. Um, so he says, actually, the better comparison to get a better idea of the roles that these items play in their religion is to compare Jesus in Christianity to the Quran in Islam. The centrality of Jesus in Christianity is similar to the centrality of the Quran in Islam. Um, and then the Bible and Muhammad are, are more similar. Um, and that's because both of them are seen as sort of the, the bit of divinity in the world, right? That of God coming into the world, um, making a gesture that allows human beings to uh, connect to God, right? Because in Christianity, Jesus is God made flesh, right? He's God made human, God in the world. Um, and his life and death are seen as a means for human beings to go back to God, um, that that's the gesture that God made. Um, by living a human life in order to allow human beings to reconnect with God. In Islam, the Quran plays that same role. Um, the Quran is God in the world. It is the little piece of God that comes into this world. Um, it is humanity's direct connection with God. Right? That's not Muhammad, because Muhammad's only a human being. He's just the vessel through which the Quran comes. Um, so the Quran is, is the, you know, the human connection to the divine. Um, the Quran is the gesture that God makes so that human beings know how to come back to God. They have this instruction manual from God um, so that they can reconnect with God. So the, he just said that, that's the better comparison. That can help us to understand 
um, how central the Quran is to Islam. Um, so that's a little bit about the Quran, and you guys are reading uh, several passages from it, so you get a, more of an idea of the content as well. Um, but there is a secondary body of literature in Islam. The Quran is the sacred text, of course it's the most central, um, but there are uh, these texts, not just one, but a collection of texts called the Hadith. Um, and the Hadiths are stories about Muhammad. So remember, the Quran doesn't really talk about Muhammad that much because Muhammad is just the person who these revelations are coming through. Um, but Muhammad is still very important in Islam. Um, it's understood that God chose him to be his prophet because he was a good man. He was honest, he was humble, he treated people well, he was fair, and he was devout. Um, so Muhammad is seen as a great example of living a life in submission to God that Muhammad lived a life in perfect submission to God. Um, so learning about him, learning about the way he lived his life, the way he treated people, um, is seen as a great ethical example for Muslims. Um, and that's where the Hadiths come in. The Hadiths are these stories, um, these, these texts, that are a collection of stories about what Muhammad did and things that he said. Um, but as I mentioned, the Hadith, it's, it's not one text, it's not one book. There are many, many Hadiths. Um, and there are different communities view different hadiths as authoritative. So not all Muslims agree that every hadith is legitimate. Um, every single hadith starts with a lineage. Um, so it starts by saying, you know, they, the hadiths were written in like the 8th and 9th centuries. Um, so a couple hundred years after Muhammad lived. Um, and each hadith starts with basically saying, um, how the, the author heard these stories, right? Because it's several generations removed from Muhammad. So each hadith kind of starts with saying, you know, this was written by, you know, this was written by um, this person. And I heard these stories from my friend who knew someone who was a friend of the prophet. Um, so it's, it's kind of proving that the stories that they're about to tell in this text um, have a direct line back to Muhammad. Um, but again, different communities view different authors uh, as more reliable than other authors. So not everyone agrees on which hadiths are authoritative. So not everyone agrees on which stories about Muhammad uh, are true, and so which one should be emulated or imitated. Um, but in general, as I said, they are stories about Muhammad's character, that he was very honest, he was fair, he was kind, he was compassionate. Um, and Muslims try to emulate Muhammad as much as possible. They try to follow his example. Um, so the hadiths, whatever individual hadiths or collections of hadiths, uh, a certain community's views, uh, a certain community views as authoritative, um, they will try to model that behavior, model what Muhammad did in his lifetime. Um, so those are very important for Muslims as well. Then the last thing that I have here um, is the soteriology uh, for Islam, the main problem and the solution. Um, and the problem in Islam, it's kind of a twofold problem, uh, is our forgetfulness and our independence. Um, so the idea in Islam is that we as human beings forget God, um, and because of that we mistakenly think that we are independent. Um, so within Islam, um, there's an understanding that actually human beings are born with an innate understanding of God, uh, or at least an innate understanding that there is a creator, um, right? We talked about this for the myths of endings, but the Quran repeatedly talks about how, you know, no one could look upon the beauty and complexity of the world and not think that there is a creator, um, that that is a, a logical conclusion to come to. And that human beings are born with this knowledge. We, as babies, we sort of have this intuition um, that we are created beings, right? We have parents who created us. Um, we didn't just appear out of nowhere. Um, and so our parents must have creators and, and then back and back and back. And there must be an ultimate creator of all of humanity. Um, but as we go through life, um, as we, you know, get distracted by the material world, uh, we forget this fact. Uh, we forget that we are created, and we start to think that we are independent instead of dependent. Uh, that we can make our own decisions for ourselves. That we know what's best for us. 
uh, instead of remembering that as created beings, we are dependent on our creator. Um, and so we need to look to our creator for guidance, right? We shouldn't be making our decisions about our lives ourselves. We should be living a life in submission to God's will, right? That God has a, a plan for us um, and we should be making our decisions based on that plan. So we forget about God and then we mistakenly think that we are independent. Um, and as we start going through the rituals of Islam, um, you can see that Islam is really a path or a way of life that never lets an individual go too long without remembering God, um, without having some type of ritual or occurrence that is a reminder of God. Um, so the, the path never lets you go too far um, without, without this reminder, without this remembrance. Okay, that's all we have for doctrine. Uh, and then next we're going to start moving on to some of the rituals of Islam.